Um, all right, so uh, there are questions to, to start us off. Questions, I had two questions. We've been, first, you had difficulty with the whole thing, if it's all right to say on this recording. <laughs> that is so correct. I was just going over what are the three conditions that have to be met in a syllogism and we haven't yes. finished it. So do you wanna go over that? Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about it. If you'd like to, if you'd like to continue from where you were, that's where we were. And then I have questions from the reading. Sure. Um, I don't know. Maybe some other somebody else's questions. I don't know. Kate, do you have any questions? No. Um. So, what 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 are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that I review the three modes? I don't know. Yeah. I think you should do whatever you planned. Okay. Well, I, I was, I was, so, so actually I have to start with a confession then. Uh, I, when, when, you know, we said that today we were going to do the syllogism, I had in my mind what is covered in that subject, you know, and I was like, okay, I, I got this, I know this. And then uh, maybe like half an hour, 45 minutes ago, I was like, oh, let me just look in the book just to make sure that I'm not forgetting any of the points. And then I realized that what the book covers under the subheading syllogisms is completely different from what I was thinking that we were gonna be talking about. So, I, and, and it's not something that I have off the top of my head. So I spent, and this is why I was late because I spent like the last 45 minutes or so just like scrambling to make sure that I had all my notes in order for this. So I play, I prepared for the wrong thing originally. So, um, but what you I was- said the next chapter, like two kinds of syllogisms? No, the, the stuff that I had in mind actually comes like many chapters later when we get into the answers to uh, consequence. Like I, for some reason, like when I was thinking of like what's covered under syllogism, I was like, yeah, we talk about what the syllogism is and then we talk about how to answer syllogism. But first we have to talk about like the parts of the syllogism and that's the part that I, I forgot. And that's the part that I couldn't, if I hadn't done what I did in the last 45 minutes, I couldn't have been sitting here being like, and this is what this is defined as, and this is what this is defined as. So having said all of that, um, I, I, what I really wanted to do tonight is go over the material covered in that chapter and, and see how folks felt about it and what questions there were and so on. So how about then, what if we, how, how about this? What if I summarize what's in the, what's in the chapter according to, to my understanding and then we do questions from there? Does that sound like an okay plan? Yeah. yeah? Okay. It's, does, it's not redundant, right? Like it's, this is worth, hearing again a summary of right okay definitely okay. not redundant <laughs> okay okay <laughs> okay so um so maybe let me start let me start with a little bit of a disclaimer slash reassurer which is that the stuff that's covered in this chapter is really, really helpful to know, to understand the depths of what's going on. And it's not like, unless you've memorized all of these definitions and all of these interrelations and all of that, then you can't do debate. It's not like that. This chapter is almost like it's explaining why the technology works, but you can use the, this technology even if you don't have that super clear in your mind, you know? Um, you have to understand like some of, like there's, there are some components that are crucial to understand. Otherwise, you, otherwise debate will just be words, right? But uh, remembering like, oh, what is the definition of the counter pervasion and what is the definition of the dissimilar class? It's okay if you forget, like you can, I mean, you know, as okay as, as, as if you forget anything else, it's not. So having said all of that, let's talk about uh, a syllogism. This is, this is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, a syllogism is a statement that makes a claim and proves it all in one breath. In the West, we have a tradition of syllogisms and in India and ergo in Tibet, they have a different tradition of syllogisms. They come out to the same thing, but they do things differently. Uh, the Western one is the Greek syllogism. This is 
frankly, a little bit beside the point, but I'll say this just so that you can make some neural connections. The way we do syllogisms in the West, and until like the late 1900s, uh, the late 19th century, the late 1800s, this was the way all logic was done in the West. Since then, we've developed a system of mathematical, uh, mathematical logic, but hold on. Let me just silence this, I'm sorry. Um, but the way syllogisms are done in the West, we do it in three sentences. We say something like, all men are mortal. Then we say a sentence, Socrates is a man. And then we say another sentence, therefore Socrates is mortal, okay? There's an advantage to that over the Indian way, which is that you're spelling out everything right there. It's all spelled out. There's a disadvantage to that relative to the Indian way, which is that you have to make, you have to be very clear as the listener on each of the three sentences and make sure that they relate to each other in certain ways and not others. Like it's, it's, it's this whole thing that we're not gonna get into right now because it's nothing to do with what we're really doing. But uh, there are all these classifications of ways that the sentences have, can connect to each other and which ones are valid and which ones are not valid. And if one is negative, but the other is positive and this and this and this and that, and it becomes this whole thing. And so um, there are many ways that a syllogism can be invalid in Western logic. Uh, but, and there are many ways that can be valid. In an uh, Indian syllogism, on the other hand, and especially in the way that the Tibetan, the Tibetan syllogism takes the older Indian syllogism and dilutes it just to the bare essentials, okay? That syllogism, it does the same work, but it does it all in one sentence. And that sentence always basically follows a single format. The sentence is always going to be the subject blank is blank because blank. The only other option, really, it's considered a separate option, is the subject. Uh, this uh, the subject blank. There exists blank because blank, right? So it's either going to be is or there exists. Like there's just two forms, but those are the only two options. And there's no, there's no. Um, well. There's no confusion. There's no different ways things can relate or not relate. Like if you hear a syllogism, you know what you're hearing. Are we okay so far? Any, qu any questions about what I've said so far? Okay. Um, so if you look at that, if you look at that sentence, it, it's just one sentence the subject blank is blank because blank. It's just one sentence. I'm just gonna use the is one just for simplicity. It's everything I'm gonna say is the same with the exists one. It's just the subject blank is blank because blank. As simple a sentence as that is, we can think about all of the different parts of it. We can think about, we can break it up in different ways. So we can break it up into two pieces. Like the subject blank is blank because blank. I broke it up in two. You could break it up into three pieces. The subject blank is blank because blank and broke it up in three, right? And so when we talk about the different elements of the syllogism, we're talking about different ways that we can break up the sentence. Um, and if I'm being honest, we're also talking about like other implications from those pieces of the sentence. So it goes like this. Um, this uh, the sentence the subject blank is blank because blank it has if we break it up into two pieces we can say it has a thesis which is a claim right and then it has a reason also known as a sign reason and sign are synonyms in this in this uh, system so the thesis could be the subject sound is impermanent. That's a thesis, that's a claim that I'm making. That's something that I'm sitting here stating that 
presumably like you don't know whether that's true or not. That's just my position. That's my claim. That's my thesis. And then I'm going to give you a reason because of being a product. And, and when I give you that reason or that sign, the idea here is that I, I'm suggesting that that proves my thesis. It's as if I said, you know, the subject sound is impermanent and you said, prove it. They said, well, it's a product, right? And that's my proof. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're like, well, that proves nothing. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> that's fair if so, but that, that's kind of where, like, that's where we kind of get into it. That's where we kind of go into it, but just starting from understanding the pieces. Any questions at this point? The translation of that word as sign seems like unusual to me. And I didn't know if you had any, like. Yeah, I, I, used, to, I used to not like it because it feels counterintuitive. And I don't remember when, but at some point it's like the penny dropped. I was like, oh my gosh, I actually love this. Um, when we think about syllogisms in the West, this might, this might sound like I'm going way off, but I, I think I'm not. When we think about syllogisms in the West, we, we tend to think about logic as being something very abstract, as being something very theoretical. Um, and we tend to think of like, in the West, we have this notion of propositions that are, that are something different from sentences and it's a complete abstraction. And then we think of proofs as being these like mathematical things that don't have, you know, whatever. But what we're talking about here in the, in the Tibetan system is something very concrete and very practical. It's not just like a theoretical thing. So if I say to you, um, behind the subject, behind that mountain, there is a fire, right? And you say, prove it. I could just point at the, as the tower of smoke that's quickly rising from behind the, the mountain. And that's a sign that there is a fire behind the mountain. Mm. That's what that means. It's, it's the reason and it's the sign. You see? Um, That's helpful, thank you. You're okay. welcome. So all syllogisms are inference based on a sign? Is that what they belong to? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of the signs are less, not, not all of the signs are necessarily perceivable through the senses, let's say, right? But the idea is that it always works in the same way. You have to look for a, a sign as something that isn't the thing itself, but that shows you that the thing itself has to be there. You know, a person has walked through this snowy field. How do you know? I can point at the footprints. The footprints are a sign that they've walked here, right? And so if I say it in a syllogism, the footprints are my reason for saying that a person has walked here. You see? So if I say the subject sound is impermanent because of being a product. So first I say the subject sounds is impermanent and you say, well, prove it. And I say, look, it's a product. And then if you see that it's a product, that's a sign that it's impermanent. So could you use the word proof for a sign? You totally could. Some translations do. The only reason that I wouldn't is because typically we use the word proof to mean syllogism. Oh. It's just, it's really just a matter of convention of how you're translating, you know, like what word are you picking for what, but you totally could. Okay. Um, but but here, I, I want to try to stick to, close to the way this book does it. Otherwise, it would just be so confusing. And in this book, proof and syllogism are synonyms, I think, basically, basically at least. And um, sign and reason are syn synonyms. 
tell me if this is too far, too theoretical. I'm, I'm basically searching to see if there is like a something you know that is related to this, but it may just be like intellectual. Something that I personally know you mean? Yeah. Or that, that one knows? That you might know about debate that is okay. related to this, but it, it may just be like a silly thing. So the I was thinking about the sign thing uh, when you're thinking about always referring to something else mm -hmm. besides the object of knowledge that I'm trying to prove. Mm -hmm. As do you know when they are? I know this is the you didn't get to it yet, but do you know when the book they talk about how you have to have another person there who's interested in being proved to. So it doesn't have to be another person. There has to be a person. A person. Okay, so it could be yourself. Yes. I see. So, but you can't ever refer to the object itself to prove itself. So you're always asking for an sign. You're asking in some way to say, I do not know the thing. I need to have a reference to help me get to the knowledge because I do not know directly this thing yet. So therefore give me a sign like, for example, cat street to point me in the direction of this knowledge. I'm sorry, like, for example, what? I'm sorry? Like, a, like I was saying, like a sign that says something like cat street this way. Okay. And that points to you in the direction of direct knowledge. But because I don't know the direct knowledge, the only way I could ever get to the direct knowledge is through a sign that refers okay. to it. So the whole, so then I would say, and this is why it does always require a person there is because you wouldn't need this whole process if you had direct insight into it. Yes. Because you wouldn't need a sign to refer to it anymore. Yes, yes. So I just, what I'm, I don't know what I'm asking. I just felt to me like, is this process and the requirement, the sign part of it, mm -hmm. a kind of saying, I don't quite get it yet. So... I would like to understand this claim you're making, but can you yes. give me a sign to help me get closer to this ultimate, this knowledge? Yes, knowledge? yes. Let, let me let me see if I can answer what I think you're asking and tell okay. me if I'm off. Sure, and um, if, it's, if it's so silly, just let me know. But. It's, not, it's not silly in the least. Um, th in Buddhism, there are different, like objects can can be different types in relation to us at a, at a given time. I think, did we talk about this recently? Maybe not. Um, an object can be a manifest phenomenon or it can be a hidden phenomenon. It can also be a, a very hidden phenomenon, but let's leave that out for just a moment. A manifest phenomenon is one that we can know directly through perception, through our senses or something like that. A hidden phenomenon is one that we can only know through inference. Right? So for example, for me at this instant, the roundness of the earth is a hidden phenomenon. But uh, the existence of my phone is a, a manifest phenomenon, right? If, if something is a manifest phenomenon, then you wouldn't need a sign, you wouldn't need inference. Almost by definition, you would just look and you'd see we would only need inference if we want to know something that is currently hidden to us. Does that, does that already answer your question or should I say? Yeah, okay? I think so. And if we were engaging in this exercise about a manifest phenomena, we would pretend like it wasn't manifest for the sake of understanding. Believe it or not, well, yeah, oh, yes, just for us right now, yes. Right. Yes, yes. In, in, in reality, you wouldn't, it would be considered idle speech to, to make a syllogism about a manifest phenomenon, you know? But for our didactic purposes and trying to understand right now, sure. Um, okay. No, but that does answer. It does that now? It really get the sign thing. Nice, helpful. Thank you. Nice, and, and I'll just also add this at the risk of undoing the others. I don't know, but I'll just add also that it 
if it's a manif- if it's a hidden phenomenon and we truly have like almost like a realization as it were of the syllogism then it's not that we've come closer to knowing it then we do know it you know um and then there's the question of like could we eventually also know it directly through perception once our circumstances change and in buddhism the answer is always going to be yes but sometimes that might require waiting until buddhahood (laughs) um so so um okay so we have the um the thesis right and then we have the um the uh, the the sign (laughs) or the or the reason um we could also talk about something that isn't exactly in the syllogism, but that is like implicit in the syllogism, which is that which is to be negated, that which is being negated. Um, we could call it the negandum, I think, the negandum, I don't know. Um, that which is to be negated. And that's basically the what like the negation of the thesis. So if I say the subject sound is impermanent, if that's my thesis, then that which is to be negated is that the subject sound is not impermanent. If I say behind that, the subject behind that mountain, there is fire, then that which is to be negated is the subject behind the mountain, there is not fire right? If I'm, whenever I'm saying something, I'm eliminating something else, namely the exact opposite of it. And why would you want to do that? Good question. I'll answer in two ways. The first is, it's not exactly so much that I would want to do that. It's that I'm automatically doing it anytime I make any claim. The moment I say the subject Snoopy is a dog, I'm, it's implicit in what I'm saying that the subject Snoopy is not not a dog. Okay. Right? And so, so I'm negating the subject Snoopy is not a dog just by saying that the subject Snoopy is a dog. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, that's the first answer that I'll give you. The second answer that I'll give you is that sometimes somebody might might say the like if, if somebody said Snoopy's not a dog, then I'll say no, no, Snoopy is a dog. That's the way that I'll negate. You see what I mean? Um, Another question you could ask is, well, why am I bothering to mention this, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that has to do with something that will come in just a minute, but there, there's a reason. Um, okay, so what we've covered so far, we have the thesis, we have the negandum, that which is to be negated, which is the opposite of the thesis, right? The denial of the thesis. And then we have the um, the reason or the sign, okay? Now, we could break things up. We could, we could break things up a little bit differently. If we take the thesis itself, we can break that up into two pieces. There's the subject and there's the predicate. Every thesis is always gonna have the subject and the predicate. The subject is also known as the basis of debate or the basis of inference. The subject is what are we talking about? Where are we looking? If I say behind the the subject behind that mountain, right? where, which mountain, where am I looking, you know? I can't say anything about 
what's happening behind that mountain if I can't look at what I'm talking about. I'm saying look in this case, literally, sure, but like it could be figuratively looking, but like what is it that we're focusing on? What is it that we're talking about? That's the subject. Um, the predicate is really, it's the predicate to be proven. Um, also known as the predicate of the probandum. The probandum, I guess, is another word for the thesis. It's just that which is to be proven, right? Uh, again, you do not need to know Latin to do Tibetan debate. Like most people who have done Tibetan debate do not know Latin. Um, so the predicate to be proven is, you know, a predicate is like, is something that we're saying is a quality or a property of something else, right? So the predicate to be proven is, what, are, what is it that we're trying to prove is a quality or a property of, of the subject? So if I say uh, the subject sound is impermanent, then impermanent is the predicate to be proven. If I say the subject Snoopy is a dog, then dog is the subject to be proven, is the, is the predicate to be proven. If I'm saying behind the subject behind that mountain, there is smoke, there is a fire, then fire is the subject to be proven, Ugh. predicate to be proven. You got what I'm saying? Yes? <laughs> okay. Um, so in the same way that there's a predicate to be proven, we can also talk about the predicate to be negated, right? That's, that's just implicit. That's not stated in the syllogism. It's just implicit. Uh, the predicate to be negated is the predicate of the negandum, negandum, whatever, the, the predicate of that which is to be negated. So it's, it's just the opposite of the predicate to be proven. So if I say the subject sound is impermanent, the predicate to be negated is not impermanent. When I say the subject Snoopy is a dog, the predicate to be negated is not a dog. When I say the subject behind the mountain there is fire, the predicate to be negated is not fire, or the absence of fire, or the emptiness of fire, right? So if you say, what are you talking about? Snoopy is not a dog. And I say Snoopy is a dog. What I'm negating is that he's not a dog. It's very interesting because I, I am of the belief personally that the single most important word in logic is the word not. Everything in logic, I think, hinges around the word not. You have to, you're always dividing things into two. Like there's what's this and there's what's not this. And, and there's nothing falls outside of that, right? There's this pen and there's not this pen. Everything else but this pen is not this pen, right? And I, I personally think of logic as just seeing all the relationships between all the knots <laughs> in order to untie some knots. Um, okay, so there's the subject, there's the thesis, there's that which is to be negated, there's the predicate to, there, there's the predicate to be proven, there's the predicate to be predicate to be negated, there's the reason aka sign. Good so far? So the only things that uh, that are left at least that I want to talk about are the concepts of the similar class and the dissimilar class. Now, this is actually this is actually going to be important. Um, you don't have to necessarily like remember the definition exactly or something. You have to you have to understand at least the concept. Even if you, you're not going to have to remember really, at least not in my experience so far. You're not going to have to remember really like the term similar class or dissimilar class, but you have to have this idea. So, the similar class refers to everything in the universe that does have the predicate to be proven. So 
the subject sound is impermanent. The predicate to be proven is impermanent. So the similar class refers to everything that is impermanent, anything that is impermanent. Whatever is impermanent is in the similar class. So I'm in the similar class. The pen is in the similar class. Mind is in the similar class. Um, my age is in the similar class, right? If I say the subject Snoopy is a dog, the predicate to be proven is dog. And so the similar class would be anything that is a dog, whatever is a dog, right? So Pele, my old dog would be in the similar class. Link, a dog that a dog's had for months, would be in the similar class, and on and on and on. If I say um, the subject behind the mountain, there is fire, um, the predicate to be proven is fire, and so the similar class would be anything where there's fire. The dissimilar class is everything where everything that doesn't have the predicate to be proven. So it's everything else. So if I say the subject sound is impermanent, the predicate to be proven is impermanent. So the dissimilar class would be everything that is not impermanent. So that would be uh, uncomposed space, the number two. Uh, a four-sided triangle. All of those things are not impermanent, so all of them are in the dissimilar class. In other words, the moment we say a thesis, we've divided everything into the world into two. There are things that are in the similar class and things that are in the dissimilar class, meaning there are things that have the predicate we're talking about and things that don't have the predicate we're talking about. And the reason that that is important is basically because one way of saying it is that what we want to figure out is whether or not the subject, whether the subject of our thesis is in the similar class or whether the subject of our thesis is in the dissimilar class. We're claiming that the subject of our thesis is in the similar class. So we need to prove that it's not in the dissimilar class. Does that make sense? If I say the subject, my husband, Nick, is in the house, right? I'm proving that he's not outside the house. I'm proving that he's not among the set of things that are outside the house or that are not in the house, really, more accurately. Right? Um, so thoughts, questions, concerns about the different parts of the, of the syllogism. Does it follow then that I would know how you're going to construct your argument as soon as you tell me your subject and your predicate? Not that I know what your reason is, but I know what your similar and dissimilar classes are. So I know what you're going to have to do. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, just to make sure we're clear, which I think is exactly what you said, like you don't know what I'm going to say for a reason, but you, you, you know what types of boundaries it has to have. Exactly. And based upon what you would say, your reason, like if you had said the first two parts, sound is an impermanent phenomenon, and you pause, my mind would say, you're now going to say because, and then you're going to have to say a dissimilar class proof to... Uh, a saying, sim similar class. It's similar class. Be. Yeah. Oh, that it's in the similar class, not the dissimilar. Yeah. So why well, did you say just before that you'd have to, you're proving that it's not in the dissimilar class? Yes, that's a good question. I probably shouldn't have said that because it makes it sound like I'm rhetorically making a point that I'm not rhetorically trying to make. I, w I was just, it, that's just the logical provision of some of, of what I'm saying. Um, that has to do with with the way, this, this goes beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but it has to do with the way Buddhism understands concepts and the way Buddhism understands how, we're, how we carve up the world. 
as dividing, like to, to say of something that it is this, it's to divide the world into two, this and not this, and say that the thing is not here. You see? But the way we say it is, it is here. So I'm sorry, like that's a very unsatisfying answer. But it, it basically, if I say the subject blank is blank, because like, you know that whatever I say for because will be a sub, it will be either something that encompasses the entire similar class and nothing else, or it's gonna be a subset of the similar class where the subject can be found. Yes, yes. Venerable Robin always likes to point out that conceptual mind perceives cup as not not cup. Yes, that's that's exactly what I'm referring to. Yes, it's called apoha apoha. I don't remember what a means not, and I forget what poha means, but What's it means p o h a poha. That's uh, Sanskrit apoha. I forget what it what poha means, but. That's, that's the Buddhist understanding of how concepts work, that concepts are the exclusion of everything else. The interesting thing is, this is so like, you know, if you feel like this is beyond you, don't even, you don't have to worry about what I'm gonna say next, but just since you mentioned it, the interesting thing is that a, good, a really good case can be made, I, I read a paper once, that the two knots in not, not a cup in that are two different kinds of not. It's first we divide the world into A and not A, and then we say that it's not, not A. The, the not A part is just a name that we give to the other side of the divide. It's like A and B, you know, but just to make it clear, say A and not A, you know, and then we say, this is not, not A. Anyway. It's, it's interesting if you think about it. It's like, it's like if somebody said, it, it's, it's an indirect thing, which makes sense because concepts are indirect. And it's as if somebody said, um, where did you put my keys? And I said, well, there are two rooms in the house, room A and room B, and I didn't put them in room B. You know, it's, it's interesting. Concepts are like that. When we say it's in room A, like what our minds are really doing is saying, okay, it's not in room B, basically. Um, it's a, there's a very interesting reason why, but, but that, that's neither here nor there for now. So any other questions about the parts of the syllogism? And, and I'm saying parts of the syllogism, but I also mean like those things that are implied. Okay, so now we get to the fun. Oh, Jana, did you have? Well, I had those two questions and one of them, I'm not sure it relates to what you're saying, but Please. it's just kind of a technical question. When in the in this summary, I don't know if it interests anybody else, the, in the components of a syllogism, when he talks about the counter provision the counter provision, he formulates it, whatever is not that predicate to be proven is necessarily not that sign. I just wondered if you could say it the same way as the forward provision. For example, yes. you can reverse those, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. necessarily not a product is not an impermanent phenomenon. Whatever is necessary. Whatever is not a product is necessarily That's not an not impermanent not phenomenon. Impermanent. The necessarily is kind of part of the of the sentence. It's uh -huh. not. It's not one. Of, it's not part of the blanks. If that makes yeah. sense. Okay. But you can. It, you that's can just a convention. Those. You can. Well, tell you what. Can you? Can you hold? It's easier to keep it all of the same, and this one is reversed. Hold hold on to that question for a minute, because I'm getting into that next. Let me, let me say my spiel about that part. And then if you feel like the question still hasn't been answered, can you ask, ask it again? Is that fair? Thank you. I appreciate your patience with that. Um, because now, now 
we can get into into the the juicy stuff, which is, uh, you know, we can say there are two types of reason or two types of sign: correct ones and incorrect ones, right? The other parts of the syllogism can't be correct or incorrect. A thesis is just a thesis. It's, a, it's just a claim. You know, it can be true or it can be false. But as long as I make a coherent, you know, as long as I say the subject blank is blank, then I'm making some thesis, I'm making some claim, right? Uh, a sign though, a sign can be correct or incorrect. And what we're gonna look at is what makes a sign correct, right? What makes a sign correct? A sign is correct. This is the way it's it's always said. If it is the three modes, the sign itself is the three modes. The three modes are the property of the subject, uh, the forward pervasion, and the counter pervasion. So what that means is we're saying that the sign is correct if the sign is the property of the subject, if the sign is the forward pervasion, and if the sign is the counter pervasion. And it it goes in that order. Right. First, you need to check whether it's the property of the subject. If it's not the property of the subject, then it's not. Then, then it doesn't matter what else would be. It, it doesn't matter because then you're just you're just saying words at that point. So, like if I said, you know, the subject Snoopy is a dog because of being a whale. It, it, you don't even have to worry about whether whales are dogs or not. Like Snoopy is not a whale. Like so, stop talking. You know. Um, so what does it mean for the sign or the reason to be the property of the subject? It means, let, let me, I'll tell you the whole bit and then I'll come back and explain it. It means that it is ascertained by someone for whom it has become the property of the subject as only existing in accordance with the mode of statement with the subject. I mean, that's self-explanatory, so let's move on. Okay, let me say, I'll say it one more time and then I'll, uh, and then I'll explain it. It is ascertained by someone for whom it has become the property of the subject as only existing in accordance with the mode of statement with the subject. Um, I've actually simplified that. It's, there's actually a lot more words in it than I said. Um, the reason for all these words is because we want to be very precise so that we're saying the right thing, but I'll explain it. We can understand it more simply, but it's, it's, as if, it's as if somebody said, what's a chair? And I said, oh, it's something you sit on. That's probably enough, right? But it's like if, if somebody were to debate me on that, it's not quite right because you can sit on a horse and a horse is not a chair, right? So the reason there are all these words and these things is because these people are used to debating and they're giving these airtight things that you can't refute. But the essence of it is this. First of all, there's a person for whom it has become the property of the subject in the syllogism. So what does that mean? That means that there's a person who, um, Who has, who is thinking, who, who is, you're telling the students, so they're thinking about the syllogism, right? And, and that person, I'm trying to think how to say this in the most simple way. Let me, let me just, let me just explain it. Forget, forget, like, I'm not going to worry about making it parallel to the way I just said it. Let me just explain it this way. For, for, uh, for a sign to be the property of the subject means that there's somebody who has valid cognition, which is a very strong thing, who knows, who, who truly actually correctly knows that the subject is that thing, okay? But they don't know and they're trying to find out whether the subject is the predicate to be proven, whether the subject is in the similar class. In other words, if I say, uh, 
the subject Snoopy is a mammal because of being a dog. Okay, the subject Snoopy is a mammal because of being a dog. Dog is the sign there, right? Dog is the property of the subject if and only if there's someone who is hearing me say this and they know that Snoopy is a dog and they're wondering whether Snoopy is a mammal. This is very special, it's very sweet, it's very practical. And air, it's also logically airtight. In the West, we say that things are valid if, if a computer would whatever. But here, we're not worried about that. If whatever is valid in Tibetan Buddhism is also gonna be valid in Western logic. But in Western logic, things are gonna be said to be valid that in Buddhism we'd say are just words, right? So let me give you another example. If I say the subject behind that mountain, there is fire because there is smoke, okay? The, the sign is smoke, right? The sign is smoke. The sign is the property of the subject if and only if there's somebody who is hearing me say this or thinking this syllogism, it could be myself, it could be somebody else. And that person knows that behind that mountain there is smoke and they're wondering whether behind that mountain there is fire. If I say the subject sound is impermanent because of being a product, product is the property of the subject if and only if there is somebody who knows that sound is a product and they're wondering whether or not a sound is a impermanent. I'll give you one, one last one. If I say the subject Socrates is mortal because of being a man, man is the property of the subject if and only if there is somebody who knows that Socrates is a man and they're wondering whether Socrates is immortal, is, is mortal. <laughs> or immortal, it's the same thing. Uh, yes, Jen. Well, that was my second question. My second question was, why is the argument on, not valid for one who has already ascertained the conclusion? Right. That's a good question. It's because... I, I guess the true and honest answer is because the, the word that's being translated as valid here doesn't really mean the same thing as the word valid in English. That's like, if I'm being truly honest, that's the answer, you know? Um, a valid reason is one that has the power to make somebody realize something true. If somebody already knows the thing, then the reason, no reason has the power to make them realize it because they already know it. What is that word? Sorry, which word? Valid, the Tibetan word. Valid. Oh, the Tibetan word, I don't know, I don't know. We could find out easily, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, actually. I'll, um, I'll try to find out. But um, the yeah, valid reason. Yeah. In the glossary, it says valid yeah. cognition or valid cognizers. Yeah, a valid cognition Sema. is pramana. Sema, that's Sema, Sema in Tibetan, pramana in, in pramana. Sanskrit. That's a whole. That's a whole other. That's a whole other thing. Um, uh, I can try to look it up later. If you, if you wouldn't mind reminding me before we stop, I'm happy to look it up. But, um, but the point though is, because, because this is interesting. If you say a syllogism, when you, if you speak a syllogism out loud, that's a kind of speech, right? And, and speech, unless it's somewhat helpful for some kind of communication, 
whether it be like a direct communication or indirect communication, but some communication, it's considered idle speech in Buddhism. And idle speech is one of the 10 negativities. So if, you, if there's somebody who's trying to understand whether or not sound is impermanent, and you say to them, oh, it is because it's a product, right? And they know that, and you and they know that sound is a product, then that was very helpful. You helped them in a big way. That was good, valid speech. Right. On the other hand, if there's somebody who already knows that sound is impermanent, they know it really well. And you say to them, you know, it is impermanent because it's a product, you're just wasting breath. You're just, it's that's idle speech. Imagine going to the Buddha and saying, Buddha, I want you to know that sound is impermanent because of being a product. That's idle speech. Similarly, if there's somebody who doesn't care whether sound is impermanent, they don't want to know, and you go up to them and you shout in their face, it is impermanent because of being a product, they're going to say, stop talking to me, and that's idle speech. You see? Stop I mean, talking to me is idle speech. That's possibly idle speech too, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but, um, you know, it's not to freak out and say like, oh my gosh, what if it turns out that they didn't care? Like, you know, like we do our best, but if you know, if you know that the person already knows, then there's no reason to try to prove it. If you know that the person doesn't care and aren't going to listen, then there's no reason to try to prove it you know? So, um, so again, in, in the West, we would consider some of those criteria uh, to, that establish whether uh, a sign is the property of the subject, we would consider some of those criteria to be pragmatical, you know, like, is the person interested? Is the per Like, Western logic doesn't ever talk about that, never. But in Buddhism, we do. But we, in the West, we'd have to say, oh, that's just a pragmatical thing. But one of the criteria has to do with something more formal that would become closer to what in the West we consider logic, which is that the person who is listening, not only do they need to not know and want to know, but they also need to know that that, sub, that, that uh, sign does pertain to that subject. That's what in the West we would consider to be part of the logic of it, you know? For me to know that Socrates is immortal because he's a man, I need to know that Socrates is a man. That's part of the property of the subject. So if I say the subject in the United States, the main language spoke, uh, or if, if I said the subject, yeah, the subject in the United States, the main language spoken is a Germanic language because it's English, right? You'd only have any hope of knowing whether it's true or not that in the United States, the main language spoken is a Germanic language based on what I'm saying, if you knew that in the United States, the main language spoken is English. You follow? Can I say something that I think is interesting? Yeah, please. Uh, there's been a, like a number of, I think I said this like in this thing, I've like tried to convince people of like karma. Mostly it's like other Buddhists who don't believe in karma because mm -hmm. it's, I get frustrated by that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's never really worked. And the argument that I think about is usually like some form of this thing, that this thing exists and then because of blah. Mm -hmm. And karma is weird because the because of blah has to be based upon some observations, right? Mm. And the observations, if it has to be the other person has to be aware of that, mm -hmm. that a lot of Buddhism requires the mindfulness to have observed that phenomena in your own life mm -hmm. or in your own mind to be able to realize that truth is a requirement to understand that property. And yes. a lot of people have not even observed 
a lot of those things. Yes. So it makes it really hard to talk about the conclusions of Buddhism because first yes. people haven't observed the phenomena that you would need to observe to talk about the conclusion. Exactly. And I would say, and that's as it should be, because in a case like that, before you before you say something to try to prove karma, you have to say, oh, why don't you sit down and notice blah, 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 blah. And then when they come back and say, oh, by gum, blah, 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 then you can say it follows that. Um, yeah. And it's... then, but I should also follow up because I have to take responsibility for the other thing. Most people are not interested in right. knowing. And that's the other big one is like, maybe I should try to trigger somebody's like qualitative curiosity. Right. And then when they're like, I am really interested in knowing whether this thing is true. And I have also observed such and such a thing. And then there would be like a place for that discussion debate to exactly happen, right exactly that's, even and, if that were like i'm oh, so sorry about that a coffee shop with a friend that would almost be like saying that would be the only effective situation yes in which that would have, have a positive impact otherwise it would be frustrating probably for both people yes is and that, what you're getting at yes what you're getting at is the other tool that we use in debate, uh, which, which we don't get to in the book for quite a bit of time, but it's actually the main tool that we use in debate. If the only tool that we had for having conversations where we are helping each other move our minds were syllogisms, we would be quiet the vast majority of the time. It's very rare, so to speak, that somebody is in a position where they know that sound is uh, is a product and, and I know we haven't gotten to this part yet. And they also know that whatever is a product is impermanent, but they're genuinely wondering whether sound is impermanent. That's really the only time when you could give them a syllogism and that where that would work. Right. Um, at other times we can use something called the consequence of a sangha which is something we'll get to later. And that's that's to trigger that curiosity, basically. Yeah. Basic, just, as a, just as like a little flavor, that's basically where you're pointing out to them a, like a consequence of their claim. And that's gonna make them wonder and then it's gonna make them come back and say, wait, so, so what is it? And now they're asking a question and then you can give them the syllogism. Uh, yes, Jenna. Well, the consequence is where the humor comes in, right? Because they can be absurd consequences. Yes. So my question is, do Tibetans have an analysis of humor? Like the Dalai Lama oh. Desmond Tutu added humor as an eighth pillar of joy, as one of the eight oh. pillars of joy. But nobody gives a teaching on humor. That's a great question. I've never come across that. I've never come across that. That's not to say that it doesn't exist. I just don't know. That's such an interesting question. Um, yeah, I have a friend who's a stand-up comedian and, and he's my friend that we do a little bit of informal Tibetan debate. And so we've had a little bit of like debate back and forth about what humor is, but I never, I've never come across a teaching about it. And um, it's very interesting. I do know that it's very culturally dependent. Um, a lot of things, like a lot of Tibetan jokes that Tibetans seem to find hilarious are things that we hear and we're like, wait, what's the joke? Like what, like what, you know? Um, and it's not like a pun or anything. It's, it's just a different, um, uh, what, anyway. Pierre Du gives an example of a joke like this. I forget. Oh yeah, name. about like it's like about the the pot, right? That one, I I actually kind of think it's fun. Like you know, whether you fall on the ground laughing or not, like I see the humor in that. But like sometimes the jokes, there's a lot of jokes that are more like uh, almost like pratfalls or like 
slapstick type of it's um where it's like oh and then he did it and then he fell down on his butt ha <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> um or there's there's another joke that i don't think i don't think it's tibetan actually but it's like somehow like in my mind is where somebody said i forget it's something like somebody was eating hot peppers and 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 somebody said oh you know those are sweet and the person said oh if they're sweet then just give me more ha 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 ha, ha. I, I don't even remember but like anyway um But then, okay, real quick, this is off topic, but just real quick, this is too sweet to pass up. It's only Salama once told this story. He said um, that one time there was a like a, a, a lama who had a few like child disciples that he took care of. And he was always trying to get them to study harder and to use their precious human life better and better and harder and harder. And he would promise them that if they studied really hard, then one day he'd take them on a picnic, right? Uh, Tibetans love picnics. And, and he keeps saying, if you study really hard, I'll take you on a picnic. If you study really hard, I'll take you on a picnic. And he, he, kept, he kept feeling that, that these kids like just didn't appreciate the value of human life so one day when they were like in the town or something uh there was like a funeral procession going by they thought okay this is a good opportunity to teach them something about the dharma so he pointed at the at the body and they said do you know where they're taking him and the children said on a picnic i think that's brilliant i told i didn't tell it well i really didn't tell it well because when Hisali Sadalam told it, like nobody could stop laughing. Even the translator, the translator couldn't get it out for a long time. I think I read it actually that that, but they said it to Tenshin, but he couldn't get it out. But because uh, he was laughing so hard. But like it's really funny. Like, do you know where they're taking him? On a picnic. Anyway. Um, okay, so. So the property of the subject, right, means that the sign is there's there's somebody who knows that the sign exists uh, with the subject, that it pertains to the subject, and they want to know whether the predicate also exists with the subject, right? They want to know whether the thesis is true. Um, now, when we say there's a few things here it says only existing in accordance with the mode of statement with the subject only existing means that it's categorical means that it's not like a doubtful thing like that it's um only existing in the sense of like not existing but also not existing not like that which it's basically just like make sure you've made up your mind type of thing you know so if i say the subject behind that mountain there is fire because there is smoke right i need to know that behind that 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 mountain there is smoke and i need to know that there is smoke not that there maybe there's smoke and maybe there's not smoke like it only i know that it only exists right something like that something like that in accordance with the mode of statement all that means is if the syllogism uses the word is, or if the syllogism uses, uses the word exists, right? I said there are those two kinds. If it uses is, then I know that it exists as is. If it uses the word exists, then I know that it exists as exists. These things are hard to say, but they're not that hard, truly. In other words, if I say the subject, that mountain is fire because it is smoke, Right, that's not going to fly because I I know that that mountain isn't smoke. But if I say the subject that mountain there is there is fire because there is smoke, meaning fire exists because smoke exists, then I need to ascertain that smoke exists, not that it is smoke. Does that make sense? 
I think I think that might be a little bit more relevant in Tibetan because they use different verbs. Whereas in English, we just say is or there is. And so like the, it's less likely to be confusing perhaps. But um, you can't prove that there is fire because it, <laughs> we can't prove that fire exists because something is smoke. You can prove that fire exists because smoke exists. You can't prove that something is fire because smoke exists there. You can prove that fire exists somewhere because smoke exists somewhere. In other words, one, one last one. If the, if the thesis says is, then the, sub, then, the, then the sign also has to be is. If the thesis says exists, then the sign also has to say exists. Something like that, at least. I, I, I'm happy to explain this more and explain it again. And for what it's worth, like I almost feel like this isn't a mis. I don't think this is a mistake we'd be likely to make. Um, no, I take that back. I take that back. There might be times when we might make it. Um, specifically, there are certain proofs in the West for the existence of God that actually hinge on this mistake, I think. Um, uh, you know, they would say if, if we were to put them in Tibetan terms, like the ontological argument, like the subject, God exists because of being that in which no, nothing greater can exist so it, 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 in any case. So what this is saying is that if the, if the claim being made here is that the, the subject is the, the sign, then the person who's understanding this has to know that the subject is the sign. If the claim that's being made is that where the subject is, the sign exists, then the person trying to know this has to know that where the subject is, the sign exists. You basically, you have what you have to know is what is being said. Basically, if if the claim is that subject is that sign, and all I know is that where that subject exists, that sign also exists. That's not good enough. Okay, I don't know. I feel like I probably made that less clear than it might have been before. But what are what are you guys thinking? I feel like if it comes up in an example a week or two from now and you refer back to this class when you said this thing this will make sense thank you i appreciate that that's very valid um and, and let me just give a couple more examples real quick just just for the moment um the subject england there is a monarch because there is a queen, right? Now, here the sign is queen. And so this would, this would be a, a valid sign, a correct sign, if, among other things, if the sign queen is a property of the subject which means that you listening would need to be wondering, first of all, whether there is a monarch in England, okay? But also, if you know that the subject England, there is a queen, right? The subject England, there is a monarch because there is a queen. So what you need to know is that the subject England, there is a queen, right? Different one. The subject um, Jungfrauhorn is a mountain because it is an alp, 
right? Well, for you to, for that to be valid for you, you'd have to know that Jungfrau Horn is an Alp. So the subject England, there is a queen. The subject Jungfrau Horn is an Alp. The subject England, there exists a queen. The subject Jungfrau Horn is an Alp. Here's a different one. Um, the subject Austria, there is a mountain because there is an Alp. Jungfrauhorn is an Alp. Austria, there is an Alp. There is means exists, an Alp exists. This is a statement of existence. The other is just the other is a statement of a property of, of what something is. When you say there is, this is a statement of existence. It's more it's actually more confusing in English, come to think of it. Just it's more confusing to explain in English because in English we just use the same verb for both. So would I be understanding it correctly that the God example. I didn't catch the whole thing, but the spirit mm -hmm. of it was problematic because um, you would be trying to prove some quality of, let's say, for God itself, or mm -hmm. and uh, in so doing, you're creating a reason about something that is in existence as the reason for a property of God having that property. So like basically God well, is a good thing because there is a cat on my wall. Basically, it, it, yeah, it's just that in the actual example, in the actual instance, it's the reverse. It's that I was trying to prove an existence based on a property. But it's the, but it's the idea that you wouldn't mix and match those two things. That That's what I was going for. Yeah, that's what I was going for. But I think in retrospect, I think that that's actually a slightly more complicated subject than, than what I'm actually trying to say here. Here, it's actually just a little bit, it's actually even a little bit more simple. You know, uh, if I say in my house, there is a musical instrument because there is a violin. What I need to know is that in my house, there is a violin. Not that my house is a violin. I mean, it's, it's, it's really simple when I say it that way, right? Uh, on the other hand, if I say my house is a, a building because it is a house, <laughs> then what I'm saying is that it is a house, not that there is a house there. So are you basically just emphasizing the difference between something having a quality and something existing? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So all, like I, I feel like I'm saying something simple in the most complicated way possible, but not on purpose for once. <laughs> um, again, we, the, the point is that we can use syllogisms to do two things. We can use syllogisms to prove that something has a property. And we can also use syllogisms to prove that something exists in a certain context, right? And all that we're saying here is that for something to be the property of the subject means that we have to know it according to the way that it's being said. Like, am I saying that it's a property of something? If so, then I need to know that it's a property of something. Or am I saying that it exists in a certain context? If so, then I need to know that it exists in a certain context. Another example, the subject Antarctica, water exists because snow exists. Exists is there is, right? It's just different ways we say it in English. The subject Antarctica, water exists because snow exists. What I need to know here is that water exists in the context of Antarctica. Water exists in Antarctica. If I don't know that, then I'm not going to be able to know that. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I made it more. That snow exists is what I need to know. 
Subject, Antarctica. Water exists because snow exists. What I need to know is that snow exists in Antarctica. The subject, Antarctica, is a landmass because it is a continent. Here, what I need to know is that Antarctica is a continent. I need to know something about what Antarctica is, not something about what exists in Antarctica. As we go, th this, this, I promise you that this is not the complicated thing. Uh, as we go, I think it will become clearer and clearer. So in any case, those are the, the things that need to happen for something to be the property of the subject. What this means again, so again, so I'll give you the whole sentence again. It is ascertained, meaning it is known, validly known, by someone for whom it has become the property of the subject in the syllogism, meaning for someone to whom the syllogism is occurring, right? As only existing in accordance with the mode of statement with the subject, right? Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, That's really chapter seven, isn't it? The two kinds of syllogism. Um, yes. Yes. I think that, that's what's next. But next time, I definitely want to also talk about the forward provision and the counter provision. And Jenna, I think that's when we'll get to your, to your other question. Um, I, I hate to, to leave you hanging a whole week. So let me just say this really quickly. Um, for the sub, for the for the sign to be the forward pervasion, that means that the person who is hearing the syllogism has has ascertained, meaning they know that that sign only exists in the similar class. Right? So if I say uh, the subject sound is impermanent because of being a product, for that to be valid, I need to know that product only exists among the impermanent, among impermanent things. Wherever you find product will be in the, in the group of impermanent things. You'll never find product outside of impermanent things. The counter pervasion is formally equivalent to that but it's psychologically different. The, the counter pervasion is, means that the, the sign is ascertained by the person who's hearing it as universally absent from the dissimilar class. Meaning if I say subject sound is impermanent because of being a product, I know that product will never be found in the group of things that aren't impermanent. Okay. When you when you say them like that, which is the way that they're usually said, those last two they're formally equivalent in in terms of Western logic. If you have the realization of one, you have the realization of the other. If you have the realization of the other, and you have the realization of the one. Uh, almost, almost, almost. Actually, it, it goes in one direction, but not necessarily the other. Um, however. There is another way to, to, to explain the pervasion and the counter pervasion, which frankly, it's not the traditional, like it's not the, the most common way, but it comes from old Tibet also. It's not like a newer thing. And I like it better. I find it a little bit more user-friendly, but basically the other way is to say that the pervasion, even though then pervasion becomes a misnomer, but like the way to explain it is like the pervasion means that if you look in the similar class, you will find at least one instance of this sign, you know? But if you look at the dissimilar class, you won't find any instance of this sign. You're basically just breaking it up into two pieces. But they both have to be true. You can't just have a... They both have to be true, yes, for, for it to be a valid reason. So that means that if I say, the subject behind that mountain 
fire exists because smoke exists, right? The forward pervasion would be in the in the traditional way, the forward pervasion would be if I knew that fire exists because smoke exists, that wherever smoke exists, fire exists. The counter pervasion would be if I knew that wherever fire doesn't exist, smoke doesn't exist, right? That's the traditional standard way of explaining it. The alternative way of explaining it would be if I, if I said behind the subject behind the mountain, there is fire because there is smoke. Uh, the pervasion would be, I know at least one place where there is uh, smoke and there's also fire. And I also know that nowhere where there is no fire, is there any smoke? So that would be invalid because you could find places with smoke and no fire. That's that's an open question. For now, for now, I mean that's not. But anyway, but you would. That's yeah. how you would be doing it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so in the in that second interpretation, the counter pervasion is doing all the heavy lifting. You know, uh, but one important thing is that in either interpretation, part of the work of the pervasion, the, the forward pervasion, is that you need to know at least one, you need to know that there exists at least one instance, at least one instance where the thing really co occurs. It's not enough to just know that there is no instance, you know where the A is absent, so the B is absent. Like you need to know that there's at least one instance where the A is present and the B is present. Because otherwise you could be arguing about something that just doesn't exist. Like if I said, the subject, uh, a married bat, the, the subject Snoopy is a married bachelor because of being a four-sided triangle. The counter pervasion there would be that I don't know of any four sided triangle outside the, the, in the set of things that aren't married bachelors. And that's true. I don't. I don't know of any four sided triangle in the set of things that aren't married bachelors because I don't know of any four sided triangles. So there, the counter pervasion would be true, but the forward pervasion wouldn't. Yes, Janet? So the non-existence of reincarnation. The non-existence of reincarnation. Does it not? It's a non-existent. I would say so. Yes. Because there's no case of. How, so what would be the proof? Because there is no instance of. Well, this this probably wouldn't be a very compelling proof for the vast majority of people at the vast majority of time, but of proof that could be valid for somebody in some circumstance would be the subject there's no the non-exist sorry there's no single instance of the of the non-existence of reincarnation right yeah like for most people in most circumstances that would be a circular argument i think but in theory, there could be somebody in some frame of mind to which this would be valid, where you could say the subject, the non-existence of, of reincarnation is a non-existent because of there being no instance of it to be found anywhere. That, so such a person would need to know that the non-existence of reincarnation there's no instance of it anywhere they would need to know that whatever is such that there's no instance of it anywhere is a non-existent and they would need to be wondering whether or not reincarnation is a non-existent then the non-existence of reincarnation is a non-existent it, it, again it would be it's hard to imagine in practice somebody being in that position but in principle that would be valid at that moment Wouldn't that be every, most everyone who doesn't believe in reincarnation? I don't think most everyone who doesn't believe in reincarnation would know, like would already know 
that the non-existence of reincarnation can't be found anywhere. They would think the non-existence of reincarnation can be found everywhere. So that Just like a valid the, argument, a valid syllogism for such a person. No. I no no. I would say like think, let's let's change it up. Let's I don't say. Teach for such a person. What, what if I said the subject, the non-existence of Santa Claus, the non-existence of Santa Claus doesn't exist. That would mean that Santa Claus exists, right? So the non-existence of Santa Claus doesn't exist because you can't find it anywhere. That's not valid. I can't so find the non-existence of Santa Claus. He doesn't exist here on planet Earth. He also doesn't exist in Mars. He also doesn't exist on Halley's Comet, you know? Um, so the non-existence of Santa Claus does exist. So that uh, that uh, reason is not the subject, uh, is not the property of the subject. You see? In the case of the non-existence of reincarnation, I would argue it's an that, that the non-existence of reincarnation is a non-exist is not existent, meaning reincarnation does exist, I would argue. Mm -hmm. You know, but the person for that to be the property of the subject for the person, they need to know that you can't find it anywhere. Does that make sense? <laughs> Think about it. I, I think I, we have to stop. So I, I, I think, think about that a little more, like write it out and think about what you're saying. The non-existence of reincarnation is a non-existence. What is that saying about reincarnation itself? You see, I would say that the non-existence of a four-sided triangle is an existent. I would say that the non-existence of water is a non-existent right? Some non-existences are existent and some non-existences are non-existent, you know? And so how would you establish the non-existence of, of reincarnation? How would you establish which one that is, right? Remembering that the person that you're establishing it for has to, has to have those insights, right? So just to sum it all up, and then we'll stop, just to sum it all up, leaving out some some details here, some key details, but just to give the taste of it all. If I say the subject A is B because it is C, that is valid if the person I'm saying to knows that the subject A is C, they know that whatever is C is necessarily B, they know that whatever is not B is necessarily not C. And they're wondering whether A is B. The subject Snoopy is a mammal because of being a dog would be valid if I know that Snoopy is a dog. I know that whatever is a dog is necessarily a mammal. I know that whatever is not a mammal is necessarily not a dog. And I'm wondering if Snoopy is a mammal. At first sight, that might seem even impossible. It's impossible. You'd say that if you know all of that, then you'd know that Snoopy is a mammal. But it's not impossible because the human brain isn't a perfect computer. <laughs> we often know the pieces of things and we just don't think about the things together. Uh, the example that my friend Mike, who I, who I I, I play around with stuff with the example that he uses is the thesis. He says the thesis that um, Bruce Willis is a man is a man named Bruce. And I think that's fantastic because it sounds so weird to think that Bruce Willis is a man named Bruce. Bruce, like that's that when you think of Bruce, you don't think of Bruce Willis. I don't know. That works for him. That works for me anyway. Uh, but you could prove. You could say the subject. Bruce Willis is a man named Bruce because of being a man named Bruce Willis. I know that Bruce Willis is a man named Bruce Willis. 
I know that whatever is a man named Bruce Willis is a man named Bruce. I know that whatever is not a man named Bruce is necessarily not a man named Bruce Willis. And yet I'm like, wait, Bruce Willis is a man named Bruce? I don't know. Maybe it's a, it's a Gus and Mike thing. I don't know. Um, uh, we, we have to stop, but was there one more question or comment? Uh, time is up, so I don't know. Did when you want to say something real quick? When you said that counter pervasion, you gave you said it exactly the way he has it in the book. But you could also say that's what I'm asking. Is could you also say what is not a dog is necessarily not a mammal? You can just reverse it. You can say the sign first. No. Okay. 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 Now I understand what you're asking. I'm sorry. I had misunderstood before. No, that you couldn't do logically. Um, It's not true that whatever is not a dog is necessarily not a mammal. For example, a cat. A cat is not a dog, but a cat is not not a mammal. A cat is a mammal. So whatever is not a mammal is not, whatever is a, not a mammal is, a, is necessarily not a dog. Yes. It has to be in that order. Exactly. For the counter pervasion, it has to be. What that means is, if you look at the class of things that are not mammals, you're not gonna find any dogs. If you look at the class of mammals, you'll find at least one dog. If you look at the class of not mammals, you're not gonna find yeah, any dogs. It the other way around, I got it. You see? Yeah. All right. All right, guys, good job. Uh, so for next time, we can, we can go ahead and read chapter seven. We'll review all of this, right? But, um, but we can keep moving too. And, uh, and so let's end with a dedication. And so let's just think that just like we thought in the beginning, uh, the, we set out to do this so that we could come closer to enlightenment. And now we've done this. And so we think, may this be, may all, all of the imprints that this leaves in our mind, all of the energy that this propels, that, that this has to propel our mind, May it be so that we can come closer and closer to perfect omniscience, perfect enlightenment, perfect love, loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta, so that we can be of best possible benefit to all universal sentient beings. Wonderful. Thank you so much.